oxyalanine syndrome or there could be a syrinx formation and there could be also multiple infarcts which occur so these are the causes of neurological deterioration and on mr you know if you see two three things you should be very careful of you will have patients with neurological deficits with the mr not showing any compression so what are those things that you look for to actually investigate it further even before a contrast image is available with you the first of them is a uh, an edema within the cord uh, on titubated images which is disproportionate to anything else that is a very characteristic fe feature there be a diffuse edema or sometimes even you know patchy syringomyelia that is something that you please investigate the second very important thing is you might see this some flow voids so these black black flow voids that you see if you see them then you please be careful you must get a contrast study done and when you get this contrast study done you will see that there will be something and then there is another very important thing you may get cord atrophy and you may get cord dilatation that's a very important thing that you look at and uh, when you get contrast then you see all these enhancing veins which are in the center so first type there are four types the first is a dural arteriovenous fistula so usually at the intervertebral foramina the 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 artery comes connected to the vein and then it comes to the cord and it causes this congestion and this causes back pressure and a congestive myelopathy so there are two ways of dealing with it either you disconnect the fistula here or you go with an angiographic approach in, during the surgery you actually actually reach the point of connection and disconnect it here so either from the artery to the vein you disconnect or you disconnect it exactly at the intervertebral foramina but for that you need an intraoperative angiogram then the second type is glomus now glomus means that it is a mass like uh, any other mass and if even with embolization or whatever what you have to do is to just treat it like a mass it's like a cavernous angioma or any other tumor and this is a glomus type of lesion and here they did a glue embolization of the uh, glomus the the radiological colleagues did that the third is metameric metameric is a juvenile type which where the vessels are maybe extradural intradural and intramedullary so it's a very diffuse kind of thing where surgery is not the option repeated staged embolization is the only option for these cases and the fourth is perimedullary now the important thing about perimedullary it's also a fistula but the only thing is it is somehow connected to the anterior spinal artery so if there is any thing which is connected to the anterior spinal artery and you see this hard hairpin bin then this is perimedullary so these are the four varieties of art spinal arteriovenous fistula or um, which so another you see perimedullary there is this com connection and you see the hairpin bend there so these are some important things so when there is single feeder it is type a when there are multiple feeders it's type b now a little bit about coils because you keep hearing about coils but what is the role of coils so one is supposing you put in uh, just coils you put so the problem is that traversing these tortuous vessels is extremely difficult with coils the second is if you have proximal occlusion that means you have blocked your point of entry into the arteriovenous malformation the third very thing thing problem about the coil is that the pathway for reembolization is blocked so it has only a palliative role and it can only work in large vessels the second is particles like gel foam or or some particles or something where it is only temporary and it will only last for a small time till you do surgery or some other intervention and then it will not work and if there is a proximal occlusion later on definitely there is going to be recurrence so it's only for a short time the third is polyvinyl alcohol so again there will be a proximal occlusion which may cause recanalization and collateralization then bucrylate or n butyl cyanoacrylate it causes a very rapid setting setting so what sometimes happen is that in a slow flow avm polymerization occurs near the catheter tip as soon as you put it it blocks so it is very sometimes difficult to pull the catheter out and uh, uh, tr trying to be very hasty in this may cause a uh, uh, inaccurate placement and finally is onyx where it is low viscosity 
So it may actually travel through the arteries into the vein and also to the various systems. So these are some of the things which go on, but Onyx has the best settling within the nidus of the AVM. The important thing here is that the artery should be embolized, also the proximal part of the vein has to be embolized. Then only you can say that it is an effective embolization. So let's look at some clinical examples with videos. So you see that there is an ar a dural arteriovenous formula. Look at this image. You have this artery coming and then suddenly you see a change of color. So the only thing which is needed is this fistula has to be disconnected. And you see that we are just putting these uh, Liga clips because what we want to do is to keep them separate from each other. When they are separate from each other, then you can actually, uh, you know, even on a plain X-ray know that they have not come back again together. So that, that is what it is. And uh, so this is what uh, you have to do. So you see that there is an artery and there is a vein and all you have to do it's a simple surgery and you can see this point of uh, you can see that there's a point here but you can see the point so so you see that uh, the the artery to the vein and all you have to do is to coagulate it and just separate the artery from the vein and that leads to uh, the congestive myelopathy goes and then you can just put liga clips on both sides and this can take care of it so this is a simple method. This can also be done in the intervertebral foramina. This can also be done in the intervertebral foramina. So that, that can be done and then that's the end of surgery. So this is a simple arteriovenous fistula and you can also do it during surgery. You can actually do an embolization and, and take it from there. Then, of course, this one was a glomus type where an endovascular embolization was done. This is a post-operative image and this worked very effectively. And then we have this uh, fourth type. Metameric, of course, is very, very diffuse, where only embolization is required. But this type four is what I will focus on and show you some surgery for it. So this is perimedullary AVM. You can see that there is an artery, there is a venous aneurysm here, and there is a backflow in the spinal cord, which is leading to continuous congestive um, myelopathy within the spinal cord. And uh, so just before I show the video, I just want to explain. So this is where the venous aneurysm is when you have opened the cord. This is the area of the congestive myelop uh, myelopathy, the dilated veins all around. This is where there was the connection on the side. And what we are doing here is to every time putting in temporary clips just to ensure that there is no sudden cord edema or there is no sudden venous dilatation. And then after the entire thing has been stripped, we also took care of this venous aneurysm by going just anterolateral to the cord a little bit from here and coagulating it. So that the veins, the compression has gone, the congestive myelopathy is gone, and the venous aneurysm has also gone. And this patient made recovery, but then the recovery also takes at least three to six months. So please, you must explain to the patient that this will not occur in a sudden, because there is a lot of edema, and this edema takes a long time to actually take care. So you see, this is during surgery and there is a thick arachnoid. There's a very thick arachnoid and you have to be very careful because if there is any bleeding, then you know, you lost your arachnoidal plane. So you have to be a little careful, gentle. And what we did is that the radiologist, Professor Fadke, um, after he had done an actual uh, embolization, uh, you know, angiogram, then he knows exactly how the feeders are. So we called him in surgery to actually guide us through the surgery. This is also very important, you know, this continuous cooperation between the radiologist and the and the surgeon. So this is the venous aneurysm. This is where the fistula is and this is the entire congestion. So this is where the fistula is. This is the venous aneurysm and this is the congestion which you see in the cord. And there is, of course, a little bit of cord edema because of which the patient had almost a grade two or three paraplegia. So what we are doing is we are just every time before you coagulate any vessel, please put temporary clips to just ensure that like yesterday, sir also did it, Professor Tanikawa, where you actually have to ensure that there is no sudden edema of the cord, no, no pile hemorrhages and no dilatation of that area. So once you do that, then you, it, it, we were guided because he has already seen a running angiogram. So he knows where to take it. And this is where uh, there, there is a complete... Uh, um, uh, you know, below that fistula is the congestive myelopathy. So now we saw that there is no uh, problem with this. Uh, we then coagulated this area just to make sure that the color of the veins will suddenly change when that per that particular feeder is gone. And this has this may have to be done at multiple levels, not at a single level. 
So this was done. And after this has been disconnected, so this is where the venous aneurysm is, and this is the lower end of the congestive myelopathy. Sometimes this will disappear by itself, but in this case, it was so thick that it was actually, once the dura would be closed, then it was causing actually compression in the cord. So we thought uh, uh, that we could actually strip it off. So, uh, but sometimes, you know, it will also disappear by itself. So again, what we did was we just put some temporary clips and with this temporary clips, we are making sure that, uh, uh, you know, there is no cord edema, there is no change. And because we have already uh, taken off the source of the arterial supply, the color has changed, you know, it has become darker now. So this is, this is, this is. so now after we have ensured that, okay, there is no change and continuous irrigation is required. In vascular cases, the very important thing is that continuous irrigation is required so that, uh, you know, it doesn't get st stuck onto the uh, uh, blades of the cord. And then with a very gentle, this has to be done extremely slowly because the cord is also edematous. And in case you feel that this is not getting stripped off, then you can just leave it alone and not really do too much. But then we found that in most places, it was possible to just strip off this uh, thick uh, venous uh, um, structure there. And uh, we could actually uh, go on... Uh, uh, um, you know, dissecting it off. And the pile, pile uh, you know, surface has to be maintained. And I, I'll just show you, still with all this, the amount of pressure there is in the veins, I'll just uh, uh, show you at some point. Uh, so gradually we are stripping off from the edematous cord. And, uh, and the arachnoid is also extremely thin here. So just continuously, you have to make sure that when you are stripping it off, there will be uh, uh, you that there will be at any given point of time there is no um, you know cord edema or any change of the character of the cord. Now after this has been done, this is the venous aneurysm, and from here it's getting its supply, and uh, therefore we have to open this arachnoid here. And the cord has been shifted because of this venous aneurysm. So we were getting an arachnoidal plane there. And uh, when we didn't see, in spite of all the coagulation that you've done, the pressure is significant. And the problem with the spinal cord is that uh, the, uh, you know, putting even cottonoid even to put to actually uh, decrease the bleeding is not possible in these areas. So, uh, you know, you have to just make sure that uh, there has to be very gentle with a lot of irrigation. You have to make sure that uh, um, this is... Uh, done and uh, so so once that connection is removed then you know it is just possible that the entire thing is completely um, you can you can see that the entire so this patient made recovery he could he was able to walk not normally completely but at least to a significant extent and this is the preoperative images. You see this venous aneurysm. You see this venous, and this is the postoperative image. And you see that the con the entire congestive myelopathy has disappeared, and the venous aneurysm has also disappeared. So, what were the reasons why these patients were referred for surgery? One was a failed embolization because the vessels were too tortuous. There was a residual arteriovenous malformation. There was a low flow fistula where embolization was. Uh, I mean, they thought that surgery would be a better option. And there were multiple feeders where this can work. So therefore, I just repeat what I told you. In type 1 spinal arteriovenous fistula, you just disconnect the artery from the vein. And that is the easiest to treat and the commonest anomaly to be encountered. The second is an intramedullary, which is a glomus type, where this has to be treated like a, a, a mass. The third is a metameric or juvenile where it is intra-extra medullary, which will require multiple staged embolization. And the fourth is a perimedullary, uh, where it is technically challenging, simply because there is a close relation to the anterior and posterior spinal arteries, and there might be multiple fistulae. Thank you so much for this. Three more times. <laughs> okay.
I have some more time. Can I can show? Okay. Something more which we have found from Chittor Tirunal Institute. Of course, their radiologist Fatke was our student at Chittor Tirunal Institute many years back. We only trained him. So, what you know, type one dural AV fistula? It's all back pressure. Back pressure, congestive myelopathy. So, if you look at the angiogram, you can see both on the ventral and dorsal side a lot of flow voids. That shows it is all uh, engorged veins. The, the, the point is, you know, the veins in the posterior surface, they are in the subarachnoid plane. The veins in the ventral surface, it is in the subpile plane. So, the thing is, you know, if you see veins ventrally in the cord, uh, in the subpile plane, it is too late sometimes to treat. So, you should catch them uh, before they develop venous engorgement in the subpile plane, which usually comes in the ventral side. Okay. Um, um, so, any other questions or comments here? Uh, something you'd like to... So, one small thing which is very important is if you have a DSA or a, a DSA compatible C arm, then you can actually do an interoperative DSA, look at the point of fistula in the intervertebral foramina and actually just uh, rather than separating it. Because sometimes what happens is if the fistula is intact, it can reconnect to and recanalize to another vein and the entire thing can recur again. But if you excise the fistula completely, then that problem doesn't occur. But then uh, the more practical thing is just go to the dorsal part of the cord and disconnect the uh, vein from the rest of it so that the congestive myelopathy disappears. Uh, okay, so I think, uh, yes, uh, sorry. Yes. Yes, so you do it pre preoperatively. Yeah, yeah, you leave the catheter there and then do it. See, that is very important. You have to plan. Yeah, please go ahead. Diagnose uh, a patient with spinal AVM. How, How do, do you, what what clinical symptoms makes you? Yeah, so so there are there are multiple ways a patient can manifest. One is progressive myelopathy, which is the commonest way. And uh, on imaging, you uh, you will not see any most of it except for you know disproportionate edema. That is number one. The second is a plateau-like feature that there will be a plateau. There will be a deterioration, then stabilization, then deterioration, then stabilization. And the third is sudden deterioration, which could be either because of a venous thrombosis or an arterial thrombosis or a sudden infarct development or a spreading venous thrombosis development. So those are the ways uh, uh, our spinal AVM can actually manifest. And the problem is many times for, uh, we have a case where for three years, the patient was paraplegic and everybody said it's a disc, disc, disc when we notice that there is a disproportionate edema and then we got a, and sometimes there will be atrophy you know and then you would know why there is atrophy at one focal point and that is basically because of uh, uh, that uh, steel phenomena or because of in, infarction that uh, that part of the cord has become narrow many of them don't improve but many of them improve significantly you know, that those are things so <laughs> So these are uh, some things. So, okay, till the director, we are waiting for the director of AMS to come, but I'll show you some one more area, which uh, I think uh, you have not completely exposed to, and that is the orbit. I won't go into the detail anatomy of the orbit, but I just want to tell you some, I won't even tell you the clinical examination. I won't do all that, but I'll show you one or two interesting cases, which are, which I think uh, many of you are not exposed to. So one small point, which I'd like to mention in the orbit, supposing you get a tumor in the orbit, then, uh, uh, so, so one small point, uh, I won't go into all the detail anatomy, of course you can read about it, but there is one important point in the anatomy which is not given in any of the books and I'd like to just share that particular point with you. The ciliary ganglion is lateral to the optic nerve. You got it? The ciliary ganglion, lacrimal gland, of course, is laterally. Then you have this nasal punctum and all that. That I won't go get into. But this is the point that I'd like you to see. That the ciliary ganglion is lateral to the optic nerve. So if you have to plan approach, if you have to plan an approach, either if the lesion is more lateral to it, that's fine. Or if the lesion is 
encircling or on top of the optic nerve, then remember to stay medial to the optic nerve, always in the orbit. This is something which you need to know. If you go laterally, then this patient will develop ophthalmoplegia, which you will not be able to uh, look at. Right? So, uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll stop here. We can, I, I'll show you the, uh, there are some very interesting cases, but sir has come, so I'll just, uh, so, hello. <laughs> Uh, very good morning to all of you and uh, welcome to AIMS New Delhi. Uh, on behalf of the Institute, it is my privilege uh, to welcome you all for the fifth edition of the AK Banerji, Dr. A.K. Banerji oration. And uh, to begin with the proceedings, uh, I request uh, Professor M. Srinivas, the Director of AIMS, to welcome the orator, Professor Sanjay Vihari, with a bouquet. I now request uh, Professor S. S. Kale, uh, the head of the department neurosurgery, to introduce the audience regarding the oration. Professor Srinivas, Director Ames, all my seniors and teachers in the audience, Professor Sharma, Professor Suresh Nair, friends from other departments, Professor Alok Thakkar is here, he is Professor and Head of ENT in Ames and uh, in charge of the Innovation Center, right? That's the new thing we want to start and I'm sure uh, today's oration is going to help us in that. Friends from uh, all over the country and beyond. I can see Dr. Amit from Nepal. Uh, we have some friends from Bangladesh. My colleagues in the faculty at Ames. Um, colleague faculty from other departments. Residents, fellows, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all for the second oration which usually goes with our microneurosurgery workshop. And um, the second oration alternates between P.N. Tandon oration and A.K. Banerjee oration. So one year it's Dr. Tandon oration, one year it's Dr. Banerjee oration. So this year is uh, Dr. Banerjee oration. I'm sure uh, as far as the audience is concerned, I don't think he needs any introduction. But still, it is my duty to um, introduce the oration. So. Dr. Tandon started the department and Dr. Banerjee joined him after a few months. So for a few months it was a one-man department and in 1965 sometime Dr. Banerjee joined him. And since then it's like, um, what can I say, it's like a child you bring up. It's like a plant which you put a seed in the ground and you water it, you put fertilizer, put this, put that. Put people like other stalwarts in the institute into the ground and see that small seed grow into this huge department. So he's one of the founding fathers of this department. So it was, uh, I think it was a very small measure which we could do to name an oration after him so that we remember him for future times or at least every alternate year we definitely remember him. 
AKB, that's what we used to know him as. These are his initials, Ajit Kumar Banerjee. So, and uh, we used to write AKB and he used to say, no, no, please write unit one, no names. So one unit was PNT, one unit was AKB and he used to always say, no, one unit, two unit, don't write names. But the name stuck and we all know him by this name, especially all the people who have been his residents, AKB. He was born in 1934, had his early schooling in Allahabad. He did his MBBS from KGMC in Lucknow in 1957. Then he did MS General Surgery at KGMC Lucknow in 61. And at that time, there was no MCH degree in neurosurgery. So he did MS again, MS Neurosurgery from CMC Velour between 1962 and 64. He took up appointment as a lecturer in CMC Velour in 64, worked there briefly. And then he was actually lured here because this hospital had just started. There was old nursing block. That's the building which was there for Ames. And um, somehow Dr. Tandon convinced him to leave a place like CMC Velour and come here. CMC Velour was an established neurosurgical center with training as well. While here there was nobody except Dr. Tandon. And I remember the first day he, he tells me that when he came here, he went to that old nursing block. There was two operation theatres which were vacant at that time. And there was one gentleman reading James Hadley Chase. He didn't know who it was. Uh, so he entered. So that person looked up from his book and he said, who are you? He said, sir, I'm Ajit Kumar Banerjee. I've just joined as lecturer in neurosurgery. So he said, do you have any hobby? So he said, hobby? He says, yes, yes, do you have any hobby? He said, yes, sir, I'll, I like to read books. He says, good, because there is nothing to do here. All you will do is read books. So that's where we started, or they started. And look where we are. And then he uh, kept getting those senior appointments. And finally, he became the chief of the Neurosciences Center when we went into that building in 1988. Uh, 84 rather and since then this department has the building where we are housed at present and after his uh, uh, retirement uh, he also is the emeritus professor with our department since that time well other departments also he helped to establish for example the neurosurgery department in Mosul University in Iraq and he says there was nobody there and he went and he set up the department there. I don't know whether it is still working or not. Then he was visiting professor at Benghazi University, Libya in the 70s. He, any oration you, with worth its name, I think he has been confirmed, conferred these orations. And he has been president and founding president of many of these societies, uh, except for the Neurological Society of India, I think. The most important you know, I would say he was one of the initial innovators. That was the time when there was no microscope inside the theater. And he saw it, observed it in Europe at that time, was getting on with the microscope. And he introduced the concept of using microscope in the surgery. And that's how this name started, Micro Neurosurgery, which continues till date. And this workshop was actually meant to initiate people into how to use the microscope. That was how we started. Most of the surgery was done without the microscope. And so I think that was a single largest contribution which has helped neurosurgery tremendously is the use of microscope. And now I cannot imagine any surgery without the microscope. Such is the state. And he used to have a small training microscope in his, on his table. At that time, he tells me that there was one room shared by two faculty. So this was going on even then. For all my colleagues, this was going on even then. So across the table was Dr. Banerjee's side and this side was Dr. Tandon's side. And on his side, there was that table attachment of a microscope, a small microscope. And he used to keep looking into that and practice. That's where the skills lab started, which has now grown into that huge um, skills lab and the skills school training. Anyway, so he was initiator of so many other things, transphenoidal surgery. He used to call, uh, Dr. Kakkad used to come at that time and uh, start ENT. So ENT has always had a very close collaboration with neurosurgery, especially for transphenoidal surgery. 
brachial plexus and peripheral nerve nobody used to touch it he was one of the people who started it and he used to keep pushing and the first person he pushed was dr mehta you must do brachial plexus you must do brachial plexus aneurysm surgery expand experimental neurosurgery so it was his brain child you know dr tandon was the was the face which was facing the world the research the publication but the actual wheels which were making the department run was all dr banerji he made the place tick and aisi chabi bhari hai ki aaj tak chal rahi hai no i am not joking it's it's true so all these things he was uh, instrumental we, nobody had ever heard of the gamma knife when he made sure that we get the gamma knife way back in 1996 and we probably we would have been the first except for some underhand dealings by the bombay hospital people our mri went there and we got delayed by a few months anyway such things happen he did the huge wfns i think that was the first and the last time the wfns has come to india the world federation of neurological sciences uh, neurological surgeon societies it was in 1989 and whatever uh, uh, money was left over from that he made it into a trust and that trust has helped hundreds of neurosurgical residents to travel to attend conferences to present papers so that thing still lives on that one wfns in 1989 it still works for all neurosurgeon trainees in the country so we started this oration 8 uh, years ago these have been the uh, earlier orators and this is the fifth uh, akb oration and i would like to end with only one shlok um you know you must have heard that famous sanskrit a uh, shlok or a string of shlok which tasmay uh, shri guru ve namah every shlok ends with uh, salutations to the guru and this one goes adnyanam timirandhasya gnananjana shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmay shri guru ve namah what it means is the one who removes the darkness of ignorance from our blind eyes by applying the kajal the it's called the collerium applying the collerium of light of knowledge by whom our eyes get opened and to the world of knowledge salutations to that guru thank you very much and may i now invite uh, to introduce the orator so uh, good morning to everyone it is my distinct privilege and honor to introduce uh, the orator for prof sreeka banerji oration prof sanjay bihari who is presently the director of a very prestigious institution the shri chitra tirunal institute of medical sciences and it is probably the only medical institution which is under the department of science and technology uh so he is a, a, a globally renowned neurosurgeon specializing in skull base cranial vertebral junction complex spine vascular neurosurgery neuro oncology uh, covering all, almost the entire gamut of neurosurgery most importantly he is a avid neurosurgical teacher as you as you must have all experienced uh, yesterday by his uh, remarks during the surgery live surgery and also uh during the lecture which preceded this uh, oration Uh, so initially his uh, schooling was from uh, jaipur and he finished in medical school also from jaipur and uh, we could all always see the indications of a illustrious uh, future career where he won many medals such as the best student gold medal trophy and uh, uh, also he finished his uh, uh, general surgical training also from jaipur and he joined uh, sgpgi that's the sanjay gandhi post graduate institute of medical sciences for his neurosurgical training after finishing his neurosurgical training he also underwent uh, further training in different uh, uh, famous and renowned centers globally all around the world especially in japan uh, 
so his neurosurgical career spans almost 30 years uh, if he, he started as a faculty in uh, sanjay gandhi postgraduate institute of medical sciences where he went on to head the department for six years and he is presently the director from he was appointed in in 2022 uh, in uh, sri chitra Tirunal institute of medical sciences trivandrum so he's a uh, a prolific uh, publish uh, prolific academician and he has published more than 370 PubMed indexed publications with 142 chapters in books and also his claim to fame is that he has four bestsellers with theme publications including one uh, uh, neuro oncology atlas and during he also served as the chief editor of neurology india which is a prestigious journal of the neurological society of india and he uh, improved its impact factor from 1.41 to 2.7 which is a feat unprecedented so he has been invited as visiting professors uh, in in various countries all around the globe as you can see here and uh, the list of honors and awards is is endless and i had to actually shrink the font size to accommodate accommodate it all on one slide and uh, he has been invited as visiting faculty in several uh, universities in japan uh, uh, also uh, in uh, western hemisphere so administratively he has been uh, uh, granted very serious responsibilities as board of studies in aims bhubaneswar all all different new uh, all india institute of medical sciences that has been established by the government and uh, he's also on the executive body of uh, various uh, important scientific committees so if I have to summarize, he is an academician, teacher, and surgeon par excellence, and even Chat GPT agrees. <laughs> so it says that Professor Sanjay Vihari is known for his exceptional surgical skills and dedication to advancing the field of neurosurgery in India. He has a strong academic background and has contributed significantly to research in neurosurgical techniques and outcomes. And you can read through this, and and probably you will nod your head in agreement. So I would. <laughs> So this actually this I, I did it yesterday night. <laughs> so so I'll, I would like to now invite Professor Sanjay Vihari to deliver his oration. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, respected uh, Professor Srinivas, uh, Professor uh, Kale, uh, uh, Professor Rath, uh, Professor Tanikawa, uh, Professor B. S. Sharma, Professor Suresh Nayak, uh, respected members of uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, uh, dear students, and my own f uh, fraternity from SGPGI, who is uh, also here. Uh, you cannot imagine what a great honor and privilege it is for me uh, to be taking the Professor A.K. Banerjee oration. Uh, I have known Professor Banerjee from probably childhood, uh, I think uh, from the age of eight years. And uh, I mean, uh, I've always looked up to him and Professor Tandon for all the outstanding work they have done. Uh, for establishing this center of excellence, which all of us all over the country actually emulate. So uh, before I start my presentation, I'd like to tell you, uh, I'd like to make share a quote with you. And this is, uh, among my most prized possessions are words which I have never spoken. Uh, and uh, I think this oration relates to words which have never been spoken in any uh, neurosurgical forum of the country. 
So, uh, actually, I had the honor of uh, writing a review for Professor P. N. Tandon's book, and I think I need to quote verbatim what I had written because they form a part of my absolute personal feelings. One of the important professional relationships that have grown into a deep friendship and has withstood the test of time and change is that of Professor P. N. Tandon and Professor A. K. Banerjee. Their warm and symbiotic relationship has been already etched in the neurosurgical folklore of India. And I think this holds true because not only have they established a center of learning, but their very symbiotic relationship has actually benefited all of us in through several generations. Ames Delhi has become today the first among equals as a center of medical education and patient care. And whenever we have any ranking in the country, we only vie for the second to <laughs> exposition. We never vie for the first position. It always goes to Ames. And I think Ames deserves a big round of applause for this. <laughs> and I think in the Department of Neurosurgery, uh, the contributions which have been made by Professor Mehta and Professor B.S. Sharma have also been immense. And I'm so honored that Professor Sharma is also here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, now we have the Don here, <laughs> who uh, is actually heading the department and is doing a fantastic job. And I'm sure you don't remember where this photograph has been taken. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is uh, so this is this, and uh, we have two very important members. We have Alok, whom I've known since childhood. So we were in the same same sc school together, and then we grew, and then he, uh, you know, preceded me in SGPGI. And uh, then the entire department, Professor Suresh Nair, the wonderful department which has grown to be. And of course, uh, Dr. Manmohan is somewhere I could see him. And uh, I, I really miss him in this, uh, in this wonderful team which has developed. Uh, so when I went to SGPGI, uh, I met a person whom I revere even now. And uh, he is... Uh, Professor D.K. Chhabra. I mean, he would never speak. He would not, uh, you know, I seldom heard him uh, give a speech or even utter a full sentence ever in his life. But the example which he would, um, I mean, serve for all of us was so amazing that even now, every time I actually do something, I think of him. And the biggest thing is his reverence for his teacher which is Professor V.S. Dawe, who was Professor P. N. Tandon's uh, contemporary. And they were together at Montreal Neurological Institute together. And uh, the reverence, so Professor uh, Chabra developed uh, metastasis. And before that, I had operated on him. And uh, um, um, so the last one month before he passed away, they had a telecommunication. Dr. The way on one side and Dr. Chabra on one side, and both were, they both couldn't talk, but they both saw each other and both were smiling. And for 10 minutes, they kept watching each other and smiling at each other. And it was a very poignant moment for all of us. So they are the people who are also really great and who have established neurosurgery in North India. And then Sunday, I was encountered with a wonderful team consisting of four people, Professor Chabra, Professor Jain, Professor Banerjee and Professor Piyush Mittal. And what they taught me is the strength of a team. A team is always greater than an individual. An individual doesn't matter. The team is what is most important. And this team at that time was so stimulating and mesmerizing for me that you cannot imagine what it was. And, you know, it has still reverberates through my every pore this feeling of team spirit, which is very, very important for the growth of any institution. And then as soon as I passed out, I had this good opportunity to become the Sugita Fellow under uh, Professor Kenichiro Sugita. And uh, the person who really mentored me was Professor Yoshio Suzuki, who has been a great friend of India. And uh, he also uh, passed away 
about two years ago from metastatic cancer. But from the hospital, when we talked to each other, uh, he said, uh, Buddha is looking after me. I shall come here again. And perhaps today he is in this room looking at all of us. And uh, Professor Sugita, before he passed away, sent a atlas to Professor Chabra. And the last lines of the atlas, uh, I have taken a photograph and I would like to quote to you. Science like, uh, surgery like science and art has no end. And most of it is agony itself. So a lot of hard work, very little returns, but still it is very gratifying. And now I have the honor and privilege of being at the Sri Chitra Institute for Medical Sciences and Technology Trivandrum. It's an institute of national importance. It's a small institute compared to AIMS. Uh, less than, uh, it has 95 uh, faculty in uh, medicine and only 50 faculty members in science and technology. So total about 150. But uh, this year it has uh, uh, 50, pa almost 40 patents. Uh, three patents came today. <laughs> it has uh, huge extramural grants. The average impact factor of the publications is almost 4.7 uh, per annum. Uh, impact of the publications. The NIRF rank is ranks between 9th and 10th in the country and considering its small size and there are no um, no residents except for few MCH and DM residents and uh, there are less than six MTech students and PhD students. So it's uh, it's uh, and it's under Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, which really ably supports it. And the um, and the medical device infrastructure which comes from here is really amazing and it's been a privilege and honor for me to be a part of it. Uh, Edward Essling Cummings, he has done a radical experimentation with poetry and he talks about a very nice thing, spring. Spring is like a perhaps hand which comes carefully out of nowhere, arranging a window into which people look and changing everything carefully and without breaking anything. So what is happening is silently spring is coming into India and this spring without breaking anything, without changing anything is just opening a window and the furniture doesn't change, the people in the room don't change but as the window opens there is a sudden breeze coming in, there is a light coming in and that has the effect of revolutionizing the medical and healthcare infrastructure of the country and I'd like to tell you about it. So the title of my presentation is Biomedical Technology Development, the constellation of stars, Chitra guiding it, the insider's perspective. So what is this Chitra? That's the first question. Everybody know, nobody knows what Chitra is. So Chitra is basically a constellation of stars, which is uh, Chitra Nakshatra is a part of the Virgo, Virgo uh, constellation of stars. And the Chitra constellation falls within the Virgo zodiac sign with its deity being Vishwakarma or the celestial architect. People belonging to this constellation are markers of their own life. They be believe in the power of manifesting their life through their own deeds. And the king of Travancore, Sri Padmanabha Sami, Sri, Ch Sri Chitra Tirunal Balarama Varma was the person who donated this institute to the country and on his name because the first name of all the royal family of Travancore is named after the star constellation they are born in and so Chitra is from that star constellation he was born in. Before I go any further we all only focus on surgery or operative techniques this that continuously the focus is on this but there is another big duty we have and this duty was beautifully uh, talked about and that is circle of service. What is this circle of service? This was actually, um, you know, uh, talked about by Dr. Ra Vidantam Rajshekhar in, uh, the, in Neurology India. And what he says is that when we are operating, we, could do, we can do a particular number of cases, 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever the total number of cases. Then we teach many students. Then they actually amplify your work. So when you, they go outside, they amplify your work. And then you publish, you write books, you make devices, and they withstand the test of time. And they help a lot more people. 
So what you are doing is you are expanding your circle of service. And this is something that you need to take care of. It's not now enough to simply operate and simply, you know, just do your own work. You also have to expand your circle of service, which takes your service far beyond your own lifetime. And to give an example, what happened was that Dr. Chhabra's uh, cousin brother died of post-TBM hydrocephalus because at that time, no Indian shunt was available. And he sat down with one of his residents to, to actually make a shunt. And this shunt, oh, there was an Upadhyay shunt from Ames, there was a Chitra shunt at uh, Chri Chitra, and then the Chhabra shunt came. And they worked on materials, they worked on designs, they worked on, you know, how it will be placed, they worked on how it will, um, you know, all the animal experimentations were done, and finally it was approved. And so this is now being used in everywhere. And this is so then first thing he said in his beautiful article is the necessity is the mother of invention. So whenever, whenever you're doing something and you feel that maybe there is one idea that I have which can completely transform what you're doing, then this is what you need to do. Necessity is the mother of invention. The second very important thing which he has written there is if you take care of small things, the big things take care of by themselves. So you don't have to, you know, think big. Just small, 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 small things leads to big things. And I'll tell you how this Chabla shunt has led to a big thing. So what happened was that it was being sold in India, it was being used, used in India, and it was just going on. But then Benjamin Worf from the Harvard Medical School went to Uganda uh, to do some social service there. And he encountered a lot of uh, children with hydrocephalus. And uh, the Hakim Kodman shunt was nearly $5,000 at that point of time. And he said, I cannot afford that. So he said, is there any other shunt available any, in any part of the world which I can use? And then there was this Chabla shunt which was available for about 1,000, 1,500 rupees at that particular point of time. So he said, he got those shunts there and he started using them. But being the scientist he was, he did a randomized trial of the Chabra shunt versus the Hakim Kondman shunt. And this was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery. And the conclusion was that no advantage was found in using a shunt system that in this setting is prohibitively expensive. And then Professor Maurice Shu, who was at that time the president of the in International Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery, came to SGPJ when I was the head of the department. He went to Shah Jahanpur, where this Chabla shunt was made, and he saw that their conditions were absolutely conducive to actually um, recommending, recommending the shunt all over the world. And now the shunt is being sold in 28 countries of the world. So small things lead to big things. You just have to sit down and do them. Now comes all of us. Now this uh, uh, SGPJ has a beautiful campus, 550 acres of, and it was previously a game sanctuary. And we have beautiful animals there. So I brought out a book, which is only related to flora and fauna of SGPJ. And these, for some of these photographs are from there. And so we got, I got a perfect picture of the yin, yin and the yang, they were sitting together. This is us, each one of us is represented by these two blue bulls. There is one part of us which is only focused on neurosurgery and, you know, our clinical work and this. But there's another part of it which wants to be different. And yet this yin part of it suppresses the yang part of us simply because we are afraid, we don't know what to do. And because of that, uh, this you see those small, small people working. So I had gone to, the, to Kanyakumari and you can see those people who, uh, working there, um, those... Uh, uh, people working at the top, right, without a harness, and they were making this statue at that time and had gone. So this is exactly how we all are. We say, this problem is unsurmountable. You know, making medical devices, making things which are suitable for us is not our problem. Okay, it's unsurmountable. This is not our, it's out of course, and therefore we never attempt to do this. But suddenly what happened was I started collaborating with IIT Kanpur, and there was this young student, 23-year-old gentleman. We made this uh, retrofit uh, stretcher. And this won the Dyson Award in 2017 for the best uh, medical innovation of the country. And then we woke up, oh my god, there is something we can do. And this had led to the patent. And of course, then there's another device for this uh, CV junction um, 
for anastomosis because it's at the depth and can we actually um, uh, kind of uh, modify it can we take care of how much axial rotation that we want to correct how much is the uh, uh, translation that we can correct how much is the distraction that we want to make all this has been done and now this is being um, you know commercialized the patent registration is already with us and so now what we so from from the surface of the skin what you can actually do is to put all the screws in place and then manipulate the entire uh, craniovertebral junction in such a way that you can to the last degree actually adjust all the uh, all the positions of the screws and the bones and uh, you can actually fix it exactly at the point that you want to do it the further expansion of this will be that we can actually with a CT scan um, just feed in the values and automatically this device will at some point in the future do it for us so we don't even have to actually do the surgery once you fix it in place the entire thing manipulates itself to come to the right position and the other important thing is supposing you distract one side and when you're putting the screws again it comes back to its original position we've already seen that but this device will help it maintain its position while you're putting screws on one side and then you go to the opposite side and it can maintain its position on the opposite side so therefore um, uh, you know small things we felt that and this was a 21 or 22 year old uh, young student from IIT who actually uh, worked on it and when I took him into surgery and what we do is oh we're looking at this vessel and this nerve and this bone and he said can I get a protractor <laughs> can I get a scale and he's measuring it in a different perspective this is very important that you have people who can actually think uh, differently than you now I'll talk about the silent revolution which is gradually taking place and I'll tell you the story of this fox. So in SGPJ campus, I could get most of the other animals, but the fox was very elusive. Till one day, I was driving by and suddenly I see this fox, I suddenly I see this fox um, uh, uh, going and uh, uh, actually uh, just uh, eating something there. And I just stopped my car. As soon as my car stopped, the fox ran away. And I said, oh, what an opportunity missed. So my camera is there. And I said, oh my God, what an opportunity missed. And the fox was on the other side and wanted to come back. <laughs> and suddenly, the fox pop popped up. And I flashed my camera. One, 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 one. The, I got a perfect photograph here of that fox looking, whether, looking to see whether I have gone away. So that silently, that fox was there, very elusive, very silent, and it was there. So a silent revolution has been taking place in India. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. So... Now there is a, I'll tell you, show you some surgical videos. This is a bilateral kissing paraclinoid segment aneurysm. And you can see that these are two aneurysms, two aneurysms here, which are in the supracellar cistern. And you can see the CT angio, which shows these two aneurysms, which are kissing almost, the fundi are almost uh, attached to each other. And they were causing unilateral complete, uh, so this is like this, this has been, um, uh, so this is the aneurysm which is actually lifting up this second nerve on one side and so we put fenestrated clips here which took care of the ICA, it, it, uh, it did not prevent the lumen from compromising and this is the second aneurysm, then from the ipsilateral side we could actually uh, also clip the other aneurysms and then we did an intradural clinoidectomy on both the sides from a single approach. So, um, so this is what it is and uh, during surgery so through a transylvian approach and uh, so this is temporal this is frontal we have gone to the frontal area this is the optic nerve this is the this is a acute bleed a patient with acute bleed so you can see that there is blood in the subarachnoid space and a little bit of edema of the of the frontal lobes here this is the optic nerve and you can see that this is the contralateral aneurysm that you see and this is the distal internal carotid artery and this aneurysm is lifting up the optic nerve so th these are two kissing aneurysms so the first point of the surgery is to drill the planum sinoidale to mobilize the optic nerve. So this is the optic nerve. You mobilize the optic nerve. So uh, just uh, um, make sure that the dura of the planum sinoidale you push back and then you can drill it. This takes no time 
and within a short time you can actually see the falciform ligament which is uh, on the optic nerve and then you do an intradural clinoidectomy so this will the two maneuvers what it and this is the sphenoid sinus covered by the mucous membrane so this actually can mobilize the optic nerve towards that side and once you have done a clinoidectomy this is the carotid collar and the internal carotid artery goes like this and then goes into the cavernous sinus uh, laterally and the aneurysm is this ICA is uh, this is the aneurysm which is just below the optic nerve so this is the carotid collar being cut just to get to the proximal portion of the uh, of the uh, thing uh, and again the little bit of uh, drilling of the planum sphenoidal just to mobilize the optic nerve a little bit of medial drilling also making sure that the mucosa is not open just to sh make sure that the uh, optic nerve can be mobilized so this is the this is the proximal ICA this is the aneurysm going from below and this is the distal ICA and this is the optic nerve which is draped over the aneurysm this is the dorsum cellae and this is the diaphragma cellae and this is the pituitary gland which is going into the pituitary so what I'm trying to do is to just separate the fundus of the aneurysm from the optic nerve as well as from the planum sphenoidale and there is a little bit of bleeding from the cavernous sinus just adjacent to the cellar region and the diaphragma cellae which could only be stopped with a little bit of surgery cell and fibrin glue here so what we have to do is that the fundus part of the fundus of the aneurysm is on the diaphragma cellae and uh, part, so from all sides I'm separating it and from here the planum sphenoidale the entire aneurysm can be separated so having done that then between the optic nerve and the ICA we, we put a proximal and distal uh, clips uh, on the uh, uh, ICA and then first fenestrated clip which does not compromise the lumen of the ICA then the second fenestrated clip, which again does not uh, compromise the lumen of the ICA. But what happens is, as soon as you put the fenestrated clip, the aneurysm will burst because uh, uh, you know the pressure will actually burst the aneurysm. So that is why, by the third clip, the, the there is a little bit of bleeding there, but the lumen is not compromised. And then the third clip is placed just below the optic nerve, and this aneurysm is taken care of. And then the temporary clip is uh, removed from here and from the neck and this is the other aneurysm that you can see so this is this has been clipped and you can see that the other aneurysm which is pointing medially that is the optic nerve and that is the internal carotid artery of the contralateral side now this aneurysm is pointing medially again i have to come to the proximal end and see the proximal wall so a little bit of planum sphenoidal drilling will get me to the neck of this aneurysm here and so this wall has to be drilled to just go to the neck of the aneurysm so dissection here can be done and dissection here can be done and that will take care of the neck of the aneurysm so once this is done then there is a two clip technique this two clip technique is very important because the first clip has to be a little distal and uh, the second clip will be more prox will be more proximal so that the neck remains and yet um, supposing that the aneurysm starts bleeding you still have the neck to control so this is two clip technique is very very important when you don't have proximal control so we don't have proximal control here so this two now you can see that the aneurysm has been clipped and there's a little bit of neck left which can also be clipped so this is one of the very interesting cases where with a unilateral approach a bilaterally medial sphenoidal um, carotid ophthalmic aneurysm can be clipped so this is one of the cases so two clips there and three clips here fenestrated clips here I'll come to the point and then I come to another very complex one. It's a giant basal artery aneurysm. You see this, this is a basal artery aneurysm. This is actually splayed the peduncles of the brain stem. You can see that. And uh, uh, this is the coronal image. And you can see this is the dorsum cellae. So the neck is a little below the dorsum cellae and it is the fundus is expanding upwards uh, above this. And the CT angio clearly shows the dorsum cellae. This is the cella. This is the anterior portion, the anterior clinoids, the posterior clinoids. This is the aneurysm. This is the basal artery and the posterior cerebral artery on both sides. So this is the aneurysm which was seen. And, and on the sagittal image, you say that the neck of the aneurysm is slightly below the dorsum cellae. And uh, so what we did was an extradural. First, we did an extradural clinoidal drilling and uh, then uh, removed the meningo uh, uh, orbital band, then came laterally to the subtemporal region, saw the mandibular, extradurally saw the mandibular nerve, then reached the cavaceous quadrilateral, then this is the greater superficial petrosal nerve, 
and uh, just going medial to that and that is the cavaceous quadrilateral extradurally this is the temporal lobe that you can see and uh, then we are drilling the cavaceous quadrilateral to just make sure that the middle fossa and the posterior fossa become one single structure and coming back now we are going intradural this is the temporal lobe this is being retracted this is the temporal dura you cut the temporal dura till you reach the superior petrosal sinus like get the superior petrosal sinus you come to the edge of the tentorium and there you can see the arachnoid and the fourth nerve in the arachnoid so the important thing is to see the entry of the fourth nerve into the tentorium cut the tent posterior to that and that will give you a wide space from the you know, from the middle fossa to the entire transylvian region and that is why you have to keep the fourth nerve completely intact then a wide Sylvian fissure opening, this is the second nerve. We are going between the, in the carotid or optic space, this is the dorsum cellae, but of course it is very difficult to actually visualize the aneurysm. So we went lateral to the carotid artery and it, lateral, this is the third nerve going into the cavernous sinus, the carotid artery is here and this is the space that we exploited. So we are working in the carotico, op, uh, carotico op, uh, sorry, the now, uh, carotid uh, oculomotor corridor, this is the carotid oculomotor corridor and lateral to the third nerve. We are working in both. So you can see the fundus of the aneurysm here and then you can also see a part of the fundus here. And this is the thick arachnoid here, this is the tentorium, this is the cavernous sinus. And the third nerve is actually going into the cavernous sinus here. So this is the arachnoid being opened now. The arachnoid being opened. And... Uh, as we open the account, so that it's very important, you can see the fundus, but we have to see both the posterior cerebral arteries and we have to come proximal to it. So this is, you can see that this is the basal artery here and the, this is the third nerve and the posterior, posterior cerebral artery is coming like this and going where, we can see it more clearly. And this is where the neck is. So this is the uh, tip of the basal and this is where the aneurysm is coming. So now I can see the neck of the aneurysm and you can see the posterior cerebral artery. And this is the proximal basal artery which you can also clearly see. So you can see that this is the PCA, origin of the PCA, you can see the neck of the aneurysm. But the important thing is that the contralateral PCA is extremely difficult to visualize from this area. And the entire aneurysm is on the brainstem here. So this is uh, very important that you can actually, uh, so you can see the proximal basal artery. So now I'm a little more comfortable because I have proximal control and this is the posterior cerebral artery. This is the third nerve. This is the fundus of the aneurysm, which you can see completely. And this, uh, so uh, you can, uh, now the other important point is you can see the perforators going into the brainstem and it is important to dissect the fundus of the aneurysm from the brainstem. And the other very important thing that you can actually mobilize the oculomotor nerve a little by by actually dividing the fascia there and between the carotid artery and the oculomotor. Um, so once the, the dissector can insinuate below between the brainstem and this aneurysm, then uh, you can see the proximal control. I have good proximal control. Then I have to go contralaterally uh, uh, to actually see the posterior cerebral arteries on the opposite side. This is very important. And that is why there will be a little bit of transient third nerve palsy because uh, sometimes the third nerve is manipulated when we are doing a basal artery aneurysm. So now the art aneurysm is gently lifted up from here. It, you can also see that I have created space on both sides and the fenestrated clip will take care of the posterior cerebral artery here and take the fundus of aneurysm like this. So therefore the entire aneurysm can be clipped. So you can see that the, fen this is the fenestrated straight clip which takes the fundus and uh, um, saves the posterior cerebral artery on this side. And again, the two clip technique, you have to make two clip technique. So this is the first clip which can be applied. And then uh, this is still the fundus which is still pulsating. So if there is a pulsating fundus in an aneurysm, then you have to be a little careful. That means it is not really been taken care of. And then you put a second clip and that takes care of the second, second point. And you can see the contralateral posterior cerebral artery, which you have been able to spare on the opposite side. So therefore, the basal artery, giant basal artery aneurysm was uh, actually taken care of. And then we have, uh, um, I'm just showing this to actually prove a point and then you will realize the, the significance of what I, I, I'm doing here and later on. When we and when we did this, we found that this is one posterior cerebral artery, this is one PCA, the other one is there, 
so you can you can see that both are completely spared by the angiogram uh, by by doing the uh, uh, in the icg uh, monitoring and of course the post operative shows the both the posterior cerebral arteries which are completely intact these are the artifacts of the clip and uh, even here you can see that uh, it's it's quite okay here and the third point that i'd like to share with you is a very short video which talks about a uh, 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 a young girl who came with hemiplegia and you can see there is a complete cutoff of the internal carotid artery and the middle cerebral artery here and uh, so uh, the radiological the radiology colleagues they put some uh, 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 vasodilator into the thing so that it kind of the vessel ex expanded again and uh, then the hemiplegia improved to near normal power and then again when the patient was shifted again this vasospasm occurred and we had to again shift to the angiogram room so three times this happened and three times we have to give uh, uh, nimodipine to intravascular nimodipine to reverse the vasospasm and luckily the third time the vasospasm could be completely reversed and then um, this was the middle cerebral artery and um, so this was the final image before we took the patient for uh, surgery and you can actually see the uh, uh, so this was a dissecting an uh, aneurysm of the internal carotid artery this was this is the aneurysm below the optic nerve and so we did a little bit of clinoidectomy we put and this entire vessel was abnormal we put some surgery cell where we put a clip and we actually did surgery so this is all hardcore neurosurgery okay so you say oh this is what we do routinely on a daily basis but i just want to show you the importance of all these procedures that we do and what it leads to so therefore this is the second now you see the uh, internal carotid artery here and this is the this is the dissecting aneurysm that you see this is the abnormal surface that you see here this is the abnormal surface and this is the aneurysm which you can see this is the optic nerve this is the acom artery this is the medial part this is the lateral part and this is the um, optic nerve and you see how irregular the wall is this is a dissecting aneurysm and you can see that this is the aneurysm here so we uh, so completely dissected off the aneurysm and then uh, this part we could actually so once this aneurysm could be dissected you see the entire wall is so um, uh, abnormal and this is one of the rare pictures of a dissecting aneurysm um, uh, then one clip was applied to just take care of this part of the aneurysm so this was clipped and this abnormal vessel wall we wrapped with surgery cell and pushed fibrin glue so that this got reinforced so this actually took care of the we just aspirated to make sure that the clip is uh, in place and uh, then just put uh, some wrapped it with uh, um, areas of dissection with surgery cell and fibrin glue so we all do this but imagine the number of biomedical technology products that we are using at every single stage of surgery about which we never talk about we never talk about trolley, bed, drip set, saline drip set, IV cannula. Each one is, is a beautiful design. Each one is, a, uh, you know, is an instrument. Each one is something that we have been using forever. And we never ever think about all these things. We only think about techniques. We only think about you know, how we are going to take it further. So the silent revolution is that now people have understood that a retrievable record keeping where you can actually retrieve the record with ICD coding is extremely important in every setup of the country. It helps you do a self audit. It helps you improve. And I think this is a very important part. The second important po point is publishing. By publishing, you have preserved your experience for posterity. After 20 years, you can still go back to your original publication and actually take nuances from it. Plus, it is self-auditing. You actually self-audit. And the third point is, you acknowledge the work which is done by peers in your field. So you must cite other articles from your own country. It really helps you uh, improve. And the other important silent revolutions which have taken place is that the drug policy of India has been completely changed from the medical devices policy of the country. This is a very important thing which has come up. And this drug policy of India has taken care of five products, the electronic equipment, implants, consumables and disposables, surgical instruments, in vitro diagnostic reagents, and biological products. And what it does is, immersive technology development it talks about, 
modernize indigenous health infrastructure, startup companies, doctors should also focus on starting startup companies. There's a lot of money available on this. Developing medical devices park and contributing to it in your own areas. Developing incubation centers, which actually develops your idea into actual medical products. Large data analysis, three-dimensional printing, central analytical facility so all the equipment is present in one area and everybody can use it it's not like confined to one particular lab testing facility medical confidentiality and security medical simulation every medical college is now compulsory asked to set up medical simulation lab and each mannequin that you export for import from outside costs about one crore so telemedicine is an important aspect all these things are needed and the other very important revolution which is taking place is that the market size of this medical device company is $11 billion and India's share is 1.5%. And this is quoted from this medical device policy of India. 10 to 20% increase has been expected in the next 25 years. So we all need to contribute and you are the end users. It's like ISRO. ISRO says, I want to send a rocket to the moon. This is what I want. And the engineers and other scientists go on to making it. But doctors never express what we want. If we express what we want, they will immediately make it. So this is something that you need to look at. The other very important thing is a word called deep tech. What is deep tech? We continuously make devices, but we make simple devices without any research. So when we make devices without any research, the problem with those devices is that anybody can copy it, just make a small modification and they get the credit for it. However, deep tech actually means that the underlying scientific and engineering problems are, which are being solved by deep tech companies generate valuable intellectual property because they're hard to reproduce because so much of research has gone into it so much of background research has gone into it that it is impossible to actually replicate it in a very short time. So over four years or five years, it is impossible to replicate what has gone on. And therefore, we are all responsible for establishing deep tech in the country, wherein our intellectual input goes into making of the devices like advanced computing, advanced manufacturing, advanced materials, automotive, remote sensing, artificial intelligence and machine learning, biotechnology and life sciences, communication networks, cyber security, electronics and photonics, uh, internet of things, robotics, semiconductors, sustainable energy and clean technologies, virtual reality, and blockchain. Blockchain means how do you distribute the data, uh, uh, or the resources uniformly. And all of us have to work on these areas. If you remember that photo I told you, this is not our problem. We are surgeons. We are neurosurgeons. Yeah, but everybody else is focusing on it. And it's time that we all start focusing on these things. The National Education Policy 2020 has also immediately talked about interdisciplinary interchange, which means that a lawyer can become a neurosurgeon, an engineer can become a doctor, a doctor can become an administrative officer. And these interplay of various uh, um, you know, educational uh, platforms will really, really help in um, uh, focusing on medical device industry. The other very important thing is that intellectual property, which you know nothing about, is very, very important now because all the copyright laws are here. So you cannot say that I have got a machine from outside and now I'm going to replicate one, make it exactly like the previous one. Well, there's going to be a huge court case against it, which will ruin your hospital. So it's time that you start understanding copyright laws and working on them. Then another big, big thing, revolution which has come up in all government hospitals is government e-market. And there's a huge resistance. When I started implementing in, in my institute, oh my God, there was a huge resistance to it. But you see, this is a very important initiative. What it says is that big, the biggest companies, international companies, have to make 25 to 50% of their product in India then only they can, they can sell it in India. It's a huge revolution which has taken place. And I tell you, we need to sit on this revolution and make it happen. This will help us to help the entire country. Very, it's very, very important. And now comes another very important innovation that you need to think about. Whenever you are making a medical device, there's a proof of concept phase when you're developing an idea. And that idea is yours. And then you are manufacturing it, you are trying to make it better and better. 
and then comes the pilot production phase so up to this point it is the you are doing it yourself you are doing it yourself then the green part is the industry at this point the industry has to come in according to the new national policy device policy and when the industry comes in you are working with that industry to actually make your device and then comes the preclinical evaluation phase which is again consisting of orange and green so again you come back and now the clinical evaluation animal experimentation has to be done by both the veterinary doctor yourself as well as the industry and the clinical evaluation phase again has to be done by you in combination with the industry so you see how the translation after you have developed a proof of concept then the industry with yourself has to take it forwards to the point of translation and this is something that none of us knows anything about and i think it's time for us to actually start focusing on this then comes another very important thing in product development what stage of product development it is this is known as translation level trl means translation level so research idea you have an idea it becomes an applied research idea it becomes a project plan this is a concept phase then comes to development and standardization that is proof of concept that is also done by you the pre clinical evaluation which is trl 5 or 6 is done by the industry with you then technology transfer takes place at trl 7 clinical evaluation takes place at trl level 8 and commercialization takes place at trl level 9 you must know about this but the problem is there is a value of death in every medical device there is a value of death and what is this value of death the value of death is that up to the level that you are working okay you are working up to here academia you work up to here this is up to trl level 4 you have a fantastic idea you have made the thing you have worked on it you have translated it you have done animal experiments on it then comes the dip the dip comes because you have not able to sell this idea to the industry and that's when the device completely fails it's a fantastic product but this value of death completely causes failing of the idea but once you kind of circumvent this and you have a continuous cooperation with the industry make small products translate it then come to big products and then suddenly it becomes a success going on to trl level 7 8 9 and the big industries will never touch you till you come to tr level 8 or 9 they are not interested in anything when you are at a lower level so everybody i see i go for many meetings csir this and that dbt they all say oh we are at tr level 3 or 4 now we'll take it nothing will happen to those products till you come to tr level 7 or 8 or 9 industry will not take it this is a very important aspect to it now i was in um, sdpgi and i was walking in the corridor and you see this uh, Uh, the the monkey mother and the baby wanting to come into sdpj and i thought to myself it's not so easy dear <laughs> to come into <laughs> the institutes and this is a fantastic he just very desperately wanting to come into it so i think as doctors we also need to think about intellectual property and translation aspects and i like to little bit share with you you have done this procedure several times when you are doing a craniopharyngeoma this is uh, uh at the foramen of monro you see the arachnoid and you see all the veins around and then you put in an endoscope and suddenly the whole thing becomes green you can't see anything inside and then the green disappears again and you can see the fenestrated capsule and you can see the foramen monro then you go deep inside and you are actually you know you don't know where the uh, third ventricle floor is and then you somehow guess and uh, palpate the dorsum cellae and then go into into the pre pontine space so that is one thing the second important thing is you have see this inspissated colloid cyst this is the foramen monro again choroid plexus and you see this is the uh, then you put in the endoscope and then this inspissated material comes out and then you are continuously struggling to take out this material and the whole thing becomes hazy there is a little bit of bleeding also and everybody all of us have gone through this whole experience what have we done about it have we ever ever try to make one device or one small thing which will completely change your surgery and make it better for yourself i think the time has come for us to do that and now i'll show you a, a very uh, it's like a foramen magnum meningioma anteriorly placed foramen magnum meningioma and uh, you see that this is just anterior to the brain stem and this patient presented uh, had been operated somewhere the surgeon couldn't reach this place you can see this a little bit of suboccipital craniectomy has been done so we operated in a lateral dead lateral position so there's a relative difference between c1 and c2 do not change 
and this is a horseshoe shaped incision this is the mastoid and this is the midline and then the skin flap and then you can see the latissimus dorsi and the trapezius and this is the first layer of muscles you can actually dissect it and then you can reflect it and then comes the um, so the second layer of the muscles will come which is the splenius capitis and the longissimus capitis so and then comes the third the third layer and uh, then comes the uh, the uh, the point of the suboccipital triangle which consists of the rectus capitis posterior major and minor and superior and inferior oblique laterally and this is the foramen magnum margin which is being this is the head end this is the c1 arch here this is the vertebral artery this is the c1 arch this is the lateral aspect this is the medial aspect and this is the foramen magnum margin which is being dissected and then coming to the lateral most aspect of the lateral mass of c1 and the vertebral artery is being dissected in his facial canal so the, this is the part of the vertebral artery which will become intradural this is the part of the vertebral artery which will going to the foramen transverse area the entire vertebral artery is being um, dissected out and this is the lateral mass of the c1 the advantage of mobilizing the vertebral artery is you can shift it inferiorly and or you can shift it superiorly this is the dura exposed when you shift it superiorly you can drill the lateral mass of c1 when you shift the vertebral artery inferiorly you can drill the occipital condyle and this helps you go more anterior as compared to the normal posterior area you understand and i'll tell you the importance of that you know in short time so this is a little bit of suboccipital craniectomy that is being done with a high speed drill here and uh, you can see that a little bit of drilling of the um, uh, lateral mass of c1 as well as the occipital condyle has been done the dura has been open you can see the spinal accessory now and the pica and that is the tumor anteriorly plays meningioma looking from the opposite and this is the vertebral artery which is almost encased in the meningioma this thick one and now as we do a piecemeal dissection of this meningioma which is attached to the anterior dura and you can see the corridors you can see the lower cranial nerves and you can see the accessory nerve going downwards and gradually gradually the entire tumor is decompressed using qsa and as the tumor is decompressed more and more space is created and preserving the arachnoid the the tumor is gradually mobilized so you can see how and there is the brain stem you can actually see glimpses of the opposite side of the vertebral artery so you can see that now i'm using micro scissors each micro scissors cost about 30 40000 rupees and uh, i'm i'm just uh, doing and that's what's happened you see just see the vertebral artery got injured and this is this is actual surgery and imagine my plight at this point of time <laughs> So you can't press the brain stem, you can't do anything. So what you have to do is using a suction, went in, just anterior to the brain stem, and that's the importance of vertebral artery mobilization. You have come anteriorly, and now we put temporary clips on the vertebral artery, both proximally and distally. You can see, still see that pouring vertebral artery just anterior to the brain stem, and this patient is reasonably intact. So, um, uh, so now we put the clips. And then, because the, both the vertebral arteries were co-dominant, so uh, we could actually trap this vertebral artery uh, with a permanent clip here and make sure that the uh, thing disappears. And after that is done, so this is the permanent clip which is applied and just anterior to the brain stem. And uh, then the temporary clips were uh, removed. So once this was done, then uh, the patient was shifted and obviously you are very stressed out. You don't know what will happen. <laughs> to the patient but luckily the patient made an uneventful recovery and then i said i must document it for posterity so and the usefulness sometimes of just mobilizing the vertebral artery <laughs> and i have lost several debates on why it should not be <laughs> mobilized so this is the post this is the image and you can see that this is the um, uh, you know ct scan uh, post op this is the odontoid you see this is the point of entry and you see the clip here, which is just anterior to the brainstem. This is the clip artifact, just anterior to the brainstem here. And uh, you see the uh, sagittal images here. The tumor is completely out. And the clip here, uh, just anterior to the brainstem. And uh, you see the bone windows, which shows the clip just anterior to the brainstem. So the point that I'm making is, is that every time during surgery, whenever you encounter a problem, this is a 3D image, you can see the clip here. And this is the clip here. So every time during problem, I showed you endoscopy, I've shown you, uh, uh, you know, brain tumor surgery. So every time there is a problem, we encounter the problem, we sometimes successfully deal with it. Sometimes we don't successfully deal with it. However, we never sit back and say, hey, the next time this happens, what can we do to bring out one product 
or one instrument or one different thing which will completely help us in combating this recurrence at some other point of time. I think this is something that we all need to think about seriously. We do deep brain stimulation, you're going, just going to have a workshop in it. We do epilepsy surgery, all these are imported. We do all spinal instruments, most of these are uh, imported equipment. We do a CT, MRI, ultrasound. We don't have a, only one company has started making an, uh, one of the CT scans or MRI re recently. But functional imaging, uh, tractography, every single thing is uh, out from outside. 3D printing has come in a big way in every walk of life. Now in Sri Chitra, we are doing uh, tissue 3D printing. So we don't have to do any animal experiments. We created a, a model of a 3D printed model of a liver. And toxicology studies can be done on that. And we don't need to actually um, sacrifice animals for that. With microfluidics, you can actually de deliver the right amount of drug to the liver. And this is something you know, we really need to think about all these things which need to be done. Now, the important thing here is it's a very dynamic process where cooperation and cohesion is required. So I had just gone to see this dance performance and I was just taking photographs because I'm fond of photography. This is by Padmashri Ananda Shankar Jain and, and, and a troupe. And you look at this photograph. I just took a photograph, but you just see the photograph. This lady started bending while I was taking a long uh, uh, timing photograph. And you see this one started lifting up the li uh, limb while I was taking a long a, a long timing photograph and you see it has become a beautiful double photograph you understand so you have to you have to believe in serendipity it's not always that you what you want is what you get but sometimes what you are not expecting is more beautiful than actually what you are expecting so please understand that it's a very dynamic process where cooperation and cohesion is required so therefore i'd like to tell you a little bit about patents so patents what are patents patents are subject matter or new products, new inventive steps, utility in industry, or which are sufficiently disclosed. Okay, so this is what a patent is. Now, you can see that many devices have been made. This Chitra second generation heart valve has now been implanted in 42 patients, and there's been no complication. Then left ventricular assist device, blood flow meter, aortic stents, annuloplasty rings, atrial septal defects, they've all been made. What are the non-patentable material? which is contrary to well-established laws, which is, con which, which is injurious to public health, which is only a scientific theory or a formulation of a theory, which is a known substance, already known, you cannot patent it. Mere use of a process, machine or apparatus, mere admixing of some products is not patent. Patentable. Rearrangement, reverse engineering of known devices is not patentable. Methods of agriculture and horticulture is not patentable. And methods of treatment of human beings and animals is not patentable. This cannot be patented. So these are some important points related to patent that you must think of. So other devices which have been made are flow diverted sense, coronary stents, radio opaque embolic agent which does not use any metal. This has been made in Sri Chitra. Then many fluid flow dynamic studies have been done external defibrillator has been made and translated these are all translated products the really copyrighted products i'm not talking about implantable cardio uh, uh, verter defibrillator has been made now what are the salient features of a patent it is a statutory right which is given to the inventor by the government the it is a both can be patented the, the product can be patented and the process can also be patented. And it is only for a limited period. It's maybe for 10 years, 15 years. But then after that period is over, you have to decide whether you want to renew the patent or you don't want to renew the patent. This has to, you have to give a sufficient disclosure at the patent office. And this is, there is a territorial right on it, which is country specific, which means the third party cannot manufacture you, it, cannot, it cannot offer that device for sale, it cannot import it, it cannot license it, it cannot publish it without authorization. Then, what are the other things which can be, which can be used for protecting your business? For example, patents, trade secrets, industrial designs, trademarks, copyrights, uh, new varieties of plants, layout of integrated circuits, all of them can be protected. And the other things which have been made in are intracranial electrodes for epilepsy treatment, programmable hydrocephalic shunts was being used, the seridrain uh, shunt was being used by Chitra, then blood, uh, the brain computer interface has already been translated. 
what is the reason to patent now there could be exclusivity there is a profit and return of investment so if you have patented it somebody else makes it you can actually take money for it you can have access to technology and this also boosts corporate images the other products which have been made by chitra are multiple spinal fixation device cervical plates you have various processes which have already been made and translated what before you do a patent you have to do a prior art search what is a prior art search it is essential prior to filing a patent you have to do this search you have to do you have to make your claim to the patent you have to make sure that the invention is novel and non obvious and then you have to say that the, what are the other predicate devices predicate devices means are there some similar existing devices which perform the same functions so you have to actually look at all this before you file your patent and this is a very very specific and a technical job which has to be done by people and so pneumatic compression devices automatic contrast injector microdialysis is in the process of being made then comes the what is the preliminary effort you have to make a commercial effort inventors makes making similar products and similar patents and technology developments need to be actually looked at you have to look at what is the previous history what are the deficiencies in the previous products and what are the solutions which the thing offers then legal also you have to look at what is the scope of claims what is the ownership and what is the validity and maintenance structure and all these there is already software available so it's not like you have to apply too much of your mind to it the, the software will suggest what you need to do and these are some of the other devices uh, which are also being patented and when to file as soon as a prototype of a product is developed because if there is any delay in the patent similar inventions may take advantage of the priority publication or commercial usage of that product may be done and registration or communication may compromise the novelty of the idea that you have so what you are actually patenting is an idea more than the product this you must or a process not the actual product as soon as you publish it you cannot patent it you understand so you must remember if you have something which is patentable first patent it and then publish it then what is the procedure for obtaining a patent filing of application application after 18 months so 18 months it will be displayed then there will be a pre grant opposition by any other person some other person can claim oh hey, this patent i have already done this person cannot get it then request for examination has to be done the examination can be granted or refused and then a serial number and notification in official journal will come and then a, once it comes in the serial number then again the same thing has to be evaluated again and then finally the decision is conveyed to you so this is the entire process of the patent and again i told you there are several grounds for opposition of the patent that i can tell you that supposing information regarding a foreign filing has not been made by you all these things are required and of course the left ventricular assist device infant warmers all of them have been made by shri chitra the duration of patent can be from 15 to 20 years and the date of patent is the date of application filed in india that's the thing for the liquid embolic agent shri chitra just won the Uh, national prize from petrochemical industry the atrial septal closure device and flow diverter shunts has stent has also received a very recently the award a little bit about international patents the file patent application is for 12 months and it can be either a usa patent europe patent china patent or patent or a japan patent and the other important thing is that this is country specific so you have to understand where your business is and based on that you have to make a patent so these are all the uh, covid related products pandemic related products which have now two of them have been actually uh, taken up by who which is to be which will be disseminated throughout the world and the mou has been signed the final point that i'd like to make in this section is technology transfer so first it has to reach a readiness level meaning it has to reach a sufficient translation level before it can be transferred you have to call for an expression of interest so that you have to give equal opportunity to all industries to come and the technology transfer committee identifies the appropriate industrial partner the terms of conditions are to be decided and post transfer testing and support have to be decided now the last part of my presentation 
are only four slides, but they probably represent the most serious aspect of device development, which is quality control. Because quality control leads to longevity. If your device fails, not only will you use your, lose your credibility, but the institution will lose its credibility. So quality control is very important. And I had just come after a long day of surgery and the light was shining and then I could see this web. I could see this web and it was shining silk, silky. I just took a photograph and then I came inside and I was very tired that day. I didn't see the photograph. The next day when I expanded the photograph, I was surprised to see that there was this, uh, <laughs> you know, the spider at the end of the web and I hadn't seen it. So when we are looking at in all these uh, devices and everything, we look at everything but we don't look at quality control. And there are, quality means doing it right when no one is looking. This is a very, very important aspect. So there is fog in SDPGI and this uh, photograph come, came out very well because uh, early morning, four o'clock fog in SDPGI gave this very nice photograph. So I'll just tell you that Central Drugs Standards Control Organization or CDSCO is the one which actually decides a medical product. And therefore, they have to finally decide whether a product is patentable or not. And of course, I won't go into the timelines here, but right now what is coming is the Medical Devices Amendment Rules 2020, according to which you have to actually test your devices. So you have to have a device discovery and concept, a preclinical research, a post-market survey and monitoring, and then regulatory review. And the regulatory review is so important that if your regulatory review is not up to standards and if your device fails, then it is very dangerous. And that is why it takes so much of time. It requires animal experimentation. It requires different types of experimentation. So a class A medical device involves low risk devices like wheelchairs, walking aids. Class B devices involves low to medium risk, which includes hearing aids, um, then uh, you know, tracheal tubes and stuff. Class C devices involve moderate to high risk, which include lung ventilators, dressings, urethral stents, urinary catheters, which can be taken out of the body. And class D are those which will be permanently installed in the body, which, which involve high risk. And the testing for this will sometimes take 10 years, 15 years. So it's not like it can be just immediately done. It takes a long time. There are several regulatory conditions before you can make a device which can be installed in the body. And you, can, you have to do a biological evaluation, physical chemical evaluation, mechanical evaluation, ca various calibrations, compatibility, immunological compatibility, cytocompatibility, and we in vivo testing in animals. And then finally, human being testing under insurance cover. Absolute, and that is very expensive. So these are some of the important things that you need to do before an in vivo device actually comes into the market. You have to have a central analytical facility where all the products can be tested together. You have to have a quality cell which actually takes care of all your products. You have to have a division of engineering which takes care of all your machines. And there has to be initiatives for startup which are very, very important. All of us now have to focus on startups to form our own companies. This is what the government wants us to do. So to conclude, I'd like to share with you the seven tenets of success. This photograph was taken at the one of the beaches of uh, beautiful beaches, Shanmugam beach of uh, Trivandrum uh, at the sun has set. And I'd like to tell you about this. Real discoveries only take place when people of diverse backgrounds looking at things from their own perspective work towards a common goal. There are people who are engineers, there are scientists, there are doctors, there are people who are doing patent related work, there are people who are doing copyright related work, and you all have to get an industry, all of us to have to get together to make it happen. It cannot be done by a single individual. What we do is, in every selection, and I've been a part of nearly 30 university selections, many of the professors have been appointed, but the, what I say is, we need to focus on diversity, I want you to hire more people who look different, but think just like me. <laughs> you understand? That's what we always look for. Oh, he should be like this, conforming to our way of what an ideal person should be. But that is not what it reads. We require diversity. The second is immersion. What does reverse engineering mean? Reverse engineering means 
you you get a company you get some machine from outside and then you break it up and then you construct it again that is in engineering parlance reverse engineering in my parlance what in reverse engineering means you get into a clinical situation and in that clinical situation you decide what are the deficiencies that need to be um, bridged and then focus on changing them so this immersion is the reverse engineering that i am talking about get into an immersion and then reverse engineer what you think will be appropriate for this particular environment that is second point the third is so this was also taken at the beach and this is a moon so it appears like sun but it is the reflection of the sun on the moon which was uh, uh, and, uh, so pole dancing versus stable foundation the important thing is what we all do is we take one device and all I've seen all scientists and engineer do it and then for the rest of their lives they are working on that small device but at the end of it this can be a complete failure but if you have a stable foundation you can make multiple devices you can make multiple things you can have a team which is giving a plethora of devices and if one doesn't work then the second one will work or the third one will work. they are made with the same technology and you are the end user you know that you can make the entire spectrum of devices but you are just focusing on one equipment this is something that needs to be done rather than pole dancing where you can fall a stable foundation will make sure that you don't fall the fourth this was a beautiful uh, image which this is a momentary thing in jodhpur uh, we had gone for one conference and this was a beautiful image which came up and you can see these uh, birds they are not birds they are bats big bats they appear like birds so you all know her right she was miss world and you don't know her both are equally beautiful but you will not send this beautiful girl into miss world dressed like this so design is very important whenever you want to sell an idea you have to also focus on the design of the idea it's a very important aspect that we never focus on and there are specialized people who focus on design of whatever product you have made the fifth this is was taken in kashmir and at the dal lake now what happens is the dal lake is beautiful it's it is beautiful it is clean it is very nice very aesthetic but it requires money to make sure that it looks presentable and therefore there's this wonderful books freakonomics and super freakonomics which says that any social aspect of the organization of anything can be broken up into economics we are sitting here all listening to each other it's freakonomics what is the economic impact of what we are doing right now is something which is freakonomics and freakonomics demands that clinical engineering basic science research projects should become financially viable and independent of external sources this is the fifth point the sixth point is from my flat which is professor suresh nair's <laughs> house um the sunset at the sea looks so beautiful so i was just waiting one day and took this photograph and uh, quality ensures longevity so if you don't have quality the product will fail so you must ensure that quality comes that's the sir and the seventh point this was just taken very recently in calcutta where there was another conference so in in the japanese philosophy enzo is a full circle which people make J japanese people make it's a hobby without opening without removing their hand they will make a full circle with the paint of a brush it's known as an enzo they will spend a lifetime making an enzo but the point the philosophy is that if you look at one point on the enzo you don't know how that enzo will turn out to be but in the end the enzo will form its own circle so believe in that and start doing it making that enzo over analysis leads to paralysis you have to do what you have to do and if you continuously think about it you will never be able to do anything perfection is a focus absolutely agreed it's not the target as soon as you reach that point the targets move ahead so perfection is a focus it's never the target so this is the beautiful narmada river at jabalpur and uh, this is me and i say oh i have changed and then this is also me on the other side and then i say oh cool cool you have changed great but how define and this is what it is you have to make that conscious effort to change and then only you will change and it's a long process it's not like one day or two things you have to take risks you have to go further now 
the final thing final final thing is something that i want to share with you and uh, you think i'm an ignorant savage and you've been so many places i guess it must be so but still i cannot see if the savage one is me how can there be so much that you don't know you don't know sorry so basically this is from the pocahontas i'll just again play this but it, this is from the pocahontas song which is from walt disney movie pocahontas where in south america the spaniards come and invade and this girl falls in love with a spaniard and the spaniard wants to kill all the animals there and she says well there is many things you don't know and i'll just you think i'm an ignorant savage and you've been so many places i guess it must be so but still i cannot see if the savage one is me how can there be so much that you don't know you don't know you think you own whatever land you land on the earth is just a dead thing you can claim that i'm lord we are off in tree and creature has a life has a spirit has a name think the only people who are people are the people who look and think like you but if you walk the footsteps of a stranger you'll learn things you never knew you never Come taste the sun sweet berries of the earth. Cheers all around you, and no one's never So I'll just like to share with you three lines from it. If you walk the footsteps of a stranger, you will learn things you never knew, you never knew. No matter how much earth you own, you will only own earth until you can paint with all the colors of the wind. And third, we are all connected to each other in a circle, in a hoop that never ends. This is from Colors of the Wind by Vanessa Williams, Pocahontas soundtrack, Walt Disney Productions, which won the Academy Award for the best original song and also for the best lyrics. And the YouTube has 110 million views. Thank you so much for this immense honor and privilege. Thank you.
Thank you, sir, for that excellent presentation. Now I request Professor M. Srinivas, the Director of AIMS, to present uh, the orator with a memento and certificate. And I request Dr. Kale and Professor V. S. Sarma and uh, Professor Alok Thakkar, sir, to join us. Sir. Thank you. I think the befitting will be a standing ovation. Now I request uh, Dr. Sachin Borkar to uh, present the propose the vote of things. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Srinivas, our director, uh, Dr. Girija Rat, our uh, registrar of the institute. On behalf of the Department of Neurosurgery, we thank you for gracing this occasion. We must thank Dr. Sanjay Bihari, the orator. His uh, insights are always full of wisdom. And today uh, he talked about an unconventional but extremely inspiring topic and uh, igniting some uh, a lot of minds. I hope this will be a starting point for us to uh, work on this uh, and come up with something which he will be proud of. Thank you so much, sir. And all the co-faculties, our seniors, colleagues, uh, and a lot of wonderful audience. It was a packed house and the standing ovation was truly befitting to the talk and the oration. Thank you so much, everyone. We will join for a cup of tea outside, then we'll re resume. Thank you so much. Uh, can you switch on the live uh, streaming from the ORs also? So those of you who are interested in watching the live surgery, you can stay here. Otherwise, we have the breakfast.